So I'm very happy to be here today. My name is Jason Ross. I'm with the Schiller Institute in the United States. And the subject of my presentation today is going to be, frankly, the reason that we're here and a major reason that we have a new paradigm in the world right now, which is a discussion of the economic discoveries and method of Lyndon LaRouche, who we're very happy to have with us today. <laughs> So what I'd like to do today is I've got a three-part discussion. I'm going to go over some general economic concepts from LaRouche. I'm going to take up a specific case study. Thanks. And I'm going to take up a specific case study. <laughs> okay. We're going to have some general discussion. We're going to have a specific case study. And then we're going to talk about how to apply this in the world today in ways that we already are and in new ways. So the first thing to bring up is that only human beings have economies. This is a very basic concept, but it's because only human beings have a resonance between the way our minds work, between the way that we create ideas, and the way that the universe works, such that our ideas have a power in the universe in a way similar to the power of electromagnetism or something like this, except far more powerful. That's something that is unique about human beings. So, unfortunately, economists, by and large, don't think this way. And this is a bit of evidence for this. This shows that economists are probably the most failed profession on the planet. The biggest failure. Absolutely biggest failure. Okay. Okay. Take a look at this. In 2007, there was a survey of all of the economists in the United States, and they were asked to predict the GDP growth that they expected in 2008. As you can see from the numbers here in the histogram, the peak is about 2 to 3 percent. Most economists said 2 to 3 percent growth. 3 percent said maybe there would be a decline. Less than 0.2 percent said that there might be a drop in GDP of more than 2%. Now, what happened in 2007, 2008? And why did only one in 500 economists even envision something like that occurring? This is a failure, a dramatic failure. It means that the basis of economic thinking is completely off for the most part. So. Let's instead take a successful approach and look at some of the metrics that Mr. Lyndon LaRouche has used. So first off, let's take a long-term look at human economy. Instead of one business cycle or the market this year, let's look over thousands of years. Let's look at historical time of the human species. And again, we see this characteristic that only human beings do. We increase our population. So sometimes you may have heard that the world is overpopulated. Has anybody heard this, that we have a population problem? Yeah, we, we hear this, right? Sometimes we hear that Africa is overpopulated. Has anybody heard this? Right, OK. Not true. We do not have a population limit. Animals have a population limit. In a kilometer of land, in a, a square kilometer, in a hectare, there's a limit for the number of rabbits. For human beings, we change this limit because we discover how nature works and change our relationship to it. It's pretty simple. So the first basic metric that Mr. LaRouche uses in his economics textbook is potential relative population density. Population density is easy. How many people live per square kilometer? Relative to the quality of the land, relative to the infrastructure that we've built. What's the potential? How many people could live per square kilometer? What economic processes increase that number? Does the stock market increase this number? If you make money gambling on Wall Street or in London, has the result of that meant that more people can live a comfortable life on the planet? Of course not. Right, so what's the source of this real economic growth? 
Well, it comes from a very good way to look at it is the story of Prometheus. Prometheus is a Greek story about the creation of the human species. According to this story, Prometheus gives fire to human beings. Before Prometheus, the idea is that human beings are basically animals. Prometheus says that he brings fire, he brings poetry, he brought astronomy, he brought sailing ships, he brought the use of animals, he brought agriculture. He said, but the number one is fire. This distinguishes us from the animals. If we look at the history of the human species, we can look at, you know, maybe perhaps cave paintings, musical instruments. The earliest evidence we have is fire. Human beings use fire. And fire has changed. Wood fire. We can cook. Think about what is a resource in the wild before fire. Is rice? Is wheat? Do you eat wheat, with <clears throat> wheat without cooking it? Do you eat rice without cooking it? So we create resources, even with simple basic fire. With charcoal, we can have metallurgy. We can produce substances that never existed on the planet. Bronze. Bronze is made by people. It doesn't exist in the crust of the earth. Steam power from fire. We can turn a rock into motion. Wow. Right? Chemistry, electricity, the development of nuclear power. The idea of fire as a concept has definitely expanded over time. So let's take a look. This is an example from the United States. And you can see the amount of energy that's used per capita in the United States, roughly over the history of that country. And there's a couple things I think we'll see here. One is that overall, the use of energy has increased. It stopped increasing around the time of the assassination of President John Kennedy. The other thing we notice is that the source of power has changed. And so this brings us to our second concept from Mr. LaRouche, which is that with a new power source, it is not just more efficient. So we no longer use, okay, it's fine. We no longer use wood for energy. Coal is not only more efficient than wood, it lets us do new things. Petroleum, it holds more energy than coal does in the same volume, but also you can use it in a jet airplane. You cannot use coal in an airplane, no matter how much coal you have. You can't squirt it as a liquid fuel into a jet engine. Impossible. So another example of this <clears throat> is in the use of electricity compared to just energy overall. So here I've pulled uh, together the, the numbers from, from the United States and from China over the past 50 years. What percent of total energy use in the country is used as electricity? So that's what we're seeing here. You can see how it's been increasing. So think of what you can do with electricity that you couldn't do with a lower form of power. For cooking, you just need heat. For transportation in an engine, you just need heat. Just explosions in an engine. What about for industry? What can you do with electricity that you can't do with a steam engine? What can you do with electricity with a laser, with a computer-controlled machine? What can you do with translation equipment, presentations, lights, right? So this is a particularly more concentrated form of energy. So this is our second very basic metric, energy flux density. We want to increase the energy used per person, but specifically we want it to be in the most concentrated form that we can get it, because it allows us to do things that were impossible before. It's not just more of, it's more than. And you can't have economic development without this. This is a scatter plot. Uh, in the horizontal direction, you have energy use, I'm sorry, electricity use per capita. In the vertical direction, you've got GDP per capita. Admittedly, not the best measure ever. But it's just, it's impossible to have development without energy. So the idea of saying that we're going to, like, you know, I don't even want to mention his name, but Obama's Africa power plan was to bring in some solar panels to put on the roof of a building here and there. Pathetic. You can't have development that way. You need the highest technology. 
And you see this when you look at the earth at night. The brightness of an area is actually a very good proxy for its level of development. The brighter the area, in general, the higher the lifespans, the better the health, the higher the economic activity. You can see some of these dark areas. So, what is the value of building an infrastructure platform? What is the value of having an electricity grid in a nation? A power company might look at it in terms of how much money they get by charging people for buying electricity. A rail company might say, they might ask how much money they get in ticket fares. But the value of having a platform as a whole is clearly not measured by user fees. It's not. As a country as a whole, this platform allows higher level economic processes. So when we turn to financing, what finance mechanisms allow us to have this overall benefit? You can see the necessity for national credit, for national banking, for example, as opposed to private investment. It just can't capture the value. Next topic is materials. Again, resources, the human mind creation of resources. On the right here, you see a green rock. On the left, you see a tiny puddle of copper that was made from that rock. That rock is malachite. It's a very common ore that we use to make copper today. 2,000 years ago, it was used by the Egyptians as green paint. Okay? The development, or let's say 6,000 years ago. But with the Bronze Era, this became not just a rock, it became a source of metal. We're able to create this kind of transformation. So, what is a resource? Is this rock a resource? On its own, it's a color. With metallurgy, it becomes a source of a new material that we can make better tools with, we can have bronze with. Here's another example, aluminum. Before the full development of electricity, aluminum was very rarely used. It's very difficult for a chemistry laboratory to produce aluminum. Aluminum holds onto oxygen, it does not want to let it go. Today we make it with electricity. And so you can see as electricity developed, the production of aluminum has skyrocketed, where now it is, it's thrown away. It's not considered that valuable. That's a change in the availability of that resource because of our development. Resources are not limited. We create new ones all the time. That's economics. So if we ask about natural resources and running out of them, we can't forget that the biggest resource that we have is our mind. That is the source of all of our resources, except for maybe some berries that you might find out in the woods. All resources, we make those resources, and then we use them. Last general example, transportation. I'll show this very quickly. These are maps that show how far you could travel from New York City in different time periods. So at first on the left you see 1800. Maybe you can't read the words. The thick lines are at first numbers of days and then numbers of weeks. So how many days and then how many weeks does it take to reach a location from New York City? In 1830, you can go much further. Why? Does anybody know? Mm -hmm. Maybe not so many trains yet, but roads, canals. Here's 1857. More canals, the beginnings of the railroads, 1930. You can reach across the whole country in just a few days. The railroad crosses the entire country. The roadways have been built. It's a different country afterwards. So what's the value of building that rail system? Is it the freight charges that the railroads made? Of course not. It's a new type of economy. How do we represent that? Well, Mr. LaRouche refers to the LaRouche Riemann method. He points to the work of Bernard Riemann in laying out a basis for understanding changes that are not only numerical or quantitative, but you might say dimensional. Having a national rail network is almost like going from a flat two-dimensional world to a three-dimensional world. There's a new domain of possibility for us. 
So now I want to apply this to a specific resource that we have actually used for a very long time, uranium. Uranium has been a human resource for 2,000 years. I don't know if you knew that or not. 2,000 years ago, the Romans used uranium to make glass. It has a nice yellow-green color, so they they'd color their glass with it. So you can say, how much of a resource is this? How important is it? Not very important. It's nice. Not really a big deal, though. Um, even later, it was used as a glass. This is a, a, an electrical component from the 1950s. Anyway, so that's one thing you can do with uranium. The next big use of uranium came in the middle of the 19, in the early 1900s, and it actually was very important for agriculture. So one of the main components of fertilization, uh, if you're looking at fertilizers for the soil, the, the nutrients that Eustace Liebig figured out with, okay, we need to have these in the soil for plants to grow, is nitrogen. Nitrogen is a very key component for plant growth. It's the main component of fertilizers that we use today with potassium and other things. Where does nitrogen come from? So the atmosphere around us is 80% nitrogen. Plants can't use it. It has to be converted into a different kind of compound. What does this? Lightning actually makes a significant amount. Mostly it's bacteria living in the soil or living in the roots of plants. So if you plant um, peanuts, other legumes, alfalfa, soy, these bacteria add more nitrogen to the soil. It's very slow. So in the, late, in the 1800s, we had artificial ways of adding nitrogen. We mined saltpeter, and we used guano, bird poop. Bird poop was transported all around the world from places like Chile and islands out in the middle of the ocean because it was a very important source of fertilizer. It's very limited. There are only so many birds. So how do we expand the production of nitrogen for human life? Well, you may have heard of this. Uh, this, is, this is Fritz Haber on the left with Albert Einstein. In 1909, <clears throat> In 1909, Fritz Haber developed the famous process named after him for taking the nitrogen in the atmosphere and turning it into ammonia to make it usable for plants. How did he do that? His catalyst was uranium. So uranium had a chemical use for producing nitrogen fertilizer to feed people. Today, the modern process doesn't use uranium, but I'll tell you an amazing statistic. One-third of the nitrogen that is entering into the soil to be used by plants, one-third of it is made by the Haber-Bosch process today. In our bodies, each of us in our bodies has two or three kilograms of nitrogen. Forty percent of that, maybe one kilogram of each of our bodies, one kilogram comes from the Haber-Bosch process. Pretty amazing. So... That clearly increases the potential relative population density when we can create fertilizer from the air. Clear economic benefit. Then what I think most people think of, actually, can we go back one slide? Thanks. And then, of course, nuclear power. We just heard about this. This is the most, of course, common use for uranium today. And I want to say a little bit about why nuclear power is so excellent. So this is, we're going to compare two reactions here. On the left is a molecule of methane. So this is natural gas, cooking gas. Carbon with four hydrogens. When this combines with oxygen and burns to make carbon dioxide and water, the amount of energy released is eight electron volts. Don't worry about what is an electron volt. It's just, for now, the number is eight. On the right, we have nuclear fusion. So we have a combination of deuterium and tritium, two types of hydrogen. They combine, they make helium, they make a neutron, and you can see the number. Together, 17.6 mega electron volts. Two million times more energy in this nuclear reaction than in the chemical reaction. This is why nuclear power plants need such a tiny amount of fuel. It is inherently a more powerful domain of knowledge. So with our discovery of the nucleus, of nuclear processes, we have potentially unleashed one million times more power for our use. Now, how can we use that? How does that increase 
the potential human population density? What higher densities of energy flux processes does this allow? I'll give you an example of where it would be great if we had much more nuclear power. This, if we can get this uh, animation going. In 2015, the New Horizons spacecraft launched by NASA... Uh Uh-oh. No, can you maybe hit enter? No? Oh, nuts. Okay, well, this is what Pluto looked like before New Horizons came by in 2015. And afterwards, it looked much better. (laughs) Now, it took 10 years for the New Horizons spaceship to reach Pluto. It flew by in about four hours. Why didn't it stop? One reason, it's going to go further out to research a Kepler, a, a Kuiper Belt object, but also it couldn't stop. It doesn't have anything left in its engines. For chemical rockets, you fire your rocket and then you just coast. You just wait until you get there. You just float. To send human beings to Mars would take nine months with chemical rockets. And if you've seen any videos of the astronauts when they land on the Earth and they can't even walk, can you imagine going to Mars and then trying to do anything when you can't, you know, you wouldn't even be able to stand? So instead, if we were able to, maybe we can, uh, Matthias, can we jump ahead a, a slide or two here? Hey, stop on. Can we, can we move ahead a slide here? Is it stuck? Oh. Okay. You know, I don't even need any more pictures. We're almost at the end here. So if we have nuclear rockets, we could go to Mars in a week. We could, if there's a comet that's going to come and strike the Earth and kill all of us, we could push it away. We could completely transform our relationship to materials, to water. If we've got this incredible source of power, water desalination, it's not a big deal. We can do that. Our relationship to energy, to materials, totally transforms. So the last thing I wanted to say was about applying this in the world today which is that we've had, over the decades of work by the LaRouches, by the Schiller Institute, we've got a new paradigm that's taking over the world right now. We've got an old paradigm that needs to be brushed aside. And very importantly, we have got the specific kinds of concepts that need to be introduced into economic thought, into political thought, to create policies for the future, which would mean, for example, right now, a tremendous research effort into fusion energy. Fusion energy research, for example, in the United States is pathetic. There's really only a couple of fusion facilities. The other two have been shut down or are under reconstruction right now. It's pathetic. If you think of how much money is spent on researching better windmills or better solar panels to try to get slightly more energy from the sunshine, while neglecting fusion, which would be an immense source of power, it's completely insane, and that would be one of the, the key trajectories to go in to, for international cooperation to bring the next platform of economic development to the world. So that's what I wanted to say, and I thank you for your attention.